Doesn't it sound confusing? What is Daniel the prophet talking about? What are all these weeks and stuff? We're going to look all into that today. Good to see all of you. Good to be back. As you know, we're going through the book of De um, Revelation. And we're going to start looking at chapter 6 of the book of Revelation today. Now, I don't know if I can fit everything I want to say in 20 minutes, but we're going to give it a try. Chapter 6 begins the time of the Great Tribulation. It is the scariest time in history. It is given a lot of importance, even in the Old Testament. Do you know that the time of tribulation was also mentioned in the Old Testament? Not only the book of Revelation, and not only the New Testament. It's a seven-year time period that's given so much emphasis in all of Bible. Why is that? It's very important. This is not one of these points where you just glaze over and not pay any attention to it. Now in the Old Testament it is mentioned over 50 times. These are the phrases that explain the great tribulation that's going to happen. It is called the day of calamity, day of wrath, the day of the Lord's wrath, the day of Jacob's trouble, the day of the vengeance of the Lord, time of trouble, and the days of the Lord. All these things are mentioned in the Old Testament pointing to the great tribulation that's about to come. We believe the Great Tribulation is going to begin after the rapture. Rapture is going to happen, and then tribulation is going to begin. Now, we're going to look at, we came to chapter 6 of Revelation. So, chapter 1 showed heaven. Chapter 2 to 4 showed the church history. Now, we're going into what is about to happen in the future? What's going to happen on earth? And what's going to take place in heaven? And how it's going to affect what happens down here? And for that, the book of Revelation is going to spend chapter 6 through chapter 19. For the next 13 chapters, the book of Revelation is going to talk about the tribulation. It is a big deal. It is a scary time if you're left behind. If you have people that you know and love who are not believers, we're going to go through all the details in the coming weeks as to what is going to take place one by one. You will see geopolitical points that has been prophesied 2,000 years. 500 years ago. You will see prophecies that was prophesied 2,000 years ago that is taking place today. I have a lot to say, so I don't want to waste any more time. In order to understand this seven-year tribulation, I want you to know it has got a significant portion of the Old Testament talking about it, and it's talking to Israel. In the Old Testament, there is no church. Church came after Jesus. And from this point on, chapter 6 to chapter 19, there isn't a single mention of the church. Why? Because the church is not here. Church is raptured up into heaven. Because God did not want his children to suffer the things that is about to come to the earth. Now, let's go back to 
Daniel and his prophecy and uh, try to make sense of this thing. And you're going to hear in your travels as a believer this mention of Daniel's 70 weeks. So I hope I can squeeze it all in. I promise I will not keep you long. Um, don't like doing that. If need be, we'll, we'll have a part two next week. Now, who is Daniel? Anybody know? Of course you do. This is the same guy that spent a night with the lions and nothing happened. You know, lion, Daniel ended in the lion's den. That's the same Daniel. Now, he was studying the scriptures. He was reading the prophet Jeremiah. And he noticed that prophet Jeremiah prophesied about his condition. He is one of the exiles from Israel to Babylon. And Jeremiah prophesied that that desolation was going to be 70 years. And he realized that that was about to be fulfilled. So he did what every believer should do. When you're reading the scriptures, you come across something that the rest of the scriptures does not explain, what do you do? You Google it? No, don't. <laughs> because you never know what you're going to find out there. You start praying. That's what he did. He started praying so that God would give him a better understanding of what all this was about. And God sends an angel, Gabriel, to explain it to him. And because of time, I'm not going into all the detail. And this is what Gabriel told them. Ready? This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. This is the message from God to Daniel via Gabriel. Seventy weeks have been decreed to your people and to the holy city. Now, seventy weeks of seven. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement of iniquity, to bring in the everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision from prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, Daniel is being told by Gabriel that God is telling you what is going to happen in the future. That is what? He said, 70 weeks have been granted to you. What does that even mean? In the original translation, it said 77. Every one is a year. Now, verse 25 explains to us that the first seven sevens, which are what, 49 years, right? Gabriel is telling him that 49 years from now, the temple will be rebuilt. And if you look at history, you will find that from the order, just like Gabriel told Daniel, from the order when it was given to rebuild the temple, to its completion with um, Ezra and Nehemiah, it took exactly 49 years. So first thing, check. That's seven years. And then the angel told him, there is another 62 sevens coming up. What is that? That's 434 years. If you're counting, we are at 69 weeks. So during the 62 sevens, he said, the Messiah will come. And some scholars point out that the very day Jesus entered Jerusalem. You know, as we celebrate as, um, as the triumphal entry, when everybody was singing Hosanna, the very day 
is the completion of the 434th year. And they point out to the fact that until that day, Jesus always said, my time is not at hand. But that day, he accepted worship and he was treated as a king who entered in a, uh, in a city victoriously. And not only he didn't stop them, he encouraged them. And there is a reason for it. So the second prophecy, check. There is one week left. And we are told, because of time, I'm not going into so much detail. There was quietness. Just like it said in the prophecy, the anointed one will be taken away. Jesus was crucified. He was taken away. And then the quietness began. Church age began. Now we are at the last seven years. And this is what the book of Revelation is talking about. Now, the prophecy of Daniel on 27 says, He will make a firm covenant with the many of for one week. Who is he talking about? Who is this he that Daniel is talking about? For that, let's go to Revelation chapter 6. That's what brings us up to date right now. In Revelation chapter 6, we will see, we will begin to see who this last person, this one person who's going to usher in the last week of seven years is. Chapter 6 begins, when I saw... Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a ball. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now you might say there is not much there, but actually there is. First seal is broken. Remember the seal with seven, uh, seven seals on the scroll? Jesus breaks the first seal. Whenever something happens in heaven, it has a reaction on earth. So when Jesus breaks the first seal, something happens. At this time, the church is raptured. Believers are not here anymore. Everybody that's left on earth are basically people that don't care who Jesus is or they know him by name only and they don't really follow him or they flat out reject him. This is the earth population at this point. And Revelation describes him like this. He was on a white horse. Conquerors, kings, emperors, they rode in on white horses. So this guy is coming in as an emperor, right? And he had a ball, but there was an interesting point in his ball. There were no arrows. He had a ball, but no arrows, meaning that signifies something. That means he's, he's victorious because he's given a crown. That means that his victory is not going to come from war. It's going to come diplomatically. He's going to be victorious. But it's going to usher in, and it's going to start with when he signs an agreement between Israel and her enemy. This is going to start the seven-year period. I'm rushing through so much stuff in order to squeeze it in. So first seal, Antichrist comes in, right? And the second seal, Jesus opens the second seal. What happens? When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And another red horse went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from earth. And the men would slay one another 
and a great sword was given to him. Second seal brings in world war. Now, most likely, according to some scholars, because the Antichrist is going to make um, peace with Israel and everybody else, and there's going to be people that are going to be against it. So they're going to want to unsuccessfully fight against the Antichrist. He's going to ultimately win. So it's going to conjure up this world war. And the third seal naturally follows. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I look, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales, and I heard something, a voice from the center of the four living creatures, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Let me explain this a little bit. Antichrist comes in, he makes a deal. Second seal, war breaks out on earth. What happens every time there's a war? What is it followed by? Calamity and famine. This is what the third seal signifies. And all the explanations about wheat and barley, basically it explains that all those measurements that are given are given for one day's work. So there's going to be poverty. People are going to be hungry. The people that work are going to just make enough to eat themselves. There is nothing for the elderly. There is nothing left for the family. There's going to be hyperinflation. There's going to be famine on earth. And it is clear that our social safety nets, like social security, retirement, all that, they're going to be obsolete. They're not going to be in effect because of the worldwide calamity. But there is one interesting point that it says at the end, but don't touch the oil and the wine. What does that mean? That means the rich, the elite, they're going to be fine. The rest of the people, however, they're going to suffer. There's going to be people dying of hunger. Can you imagine going to thinking that you have some kind of a living, some kind of a safety net, some kind of a saving, some kind of social security or retirement? It's all gone. And you have no money unless you work. And when you do work, you're only going to make enough to feed yourself for that day. It's going to be an awful time to live. And what follows this kind of a condition is the fourth seal. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard a voice and the fourth living creature saying, Come, I looked and behold an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had a name, Death. And Hades was following him. Authority was given to them over one-fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Because of this famine, a quarter of the world's population is going to die. Today, it's about 2 billion people. Nearly 2 billion people will die in this time period. And the tribulation just began. Okay? This is not all of the light loss yet. This is just, j just so that we can understand, the seven-year tribulation is going to have three different parts of judgment. We are only reading the one. We are only leading the first, like, the first 25% of it, which is the seal judgments. And the last seal judgment is going to give way to the seven trumpet judgment, 
which in a way it's going to give way to the bold judgment. Now, best way to explain it, and especially now we are so near the 4th of July, is I heard is this. When you guys are going to be watching fireworks, you're going to see certain fireworks that's going to be like this. Fireworks is going to be shot up. It's going to do its thing. There's going to be one little flare left. And in that flare, is going to just explode into seven different flares. These ball judgments are connected in that way. The, uh, the first initial judgments, the seal judgments, are coming to an end. And the seventh one is going to give way to seven trumpet judgments. And when they're all done, the seven trumpet judgment is going to give way to seven ball judgments. It's going to be an awful time if you're here. Two billion people are going to die of hunger. And then, fifth seal. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Who are these people? These are the people that are, come to, that are going to come to faith during the tribulation. We're going to talk more about that next week, the 144 uh, witnesses. These are called the tribulation saints. They're crying. They're saying, Lord, when are you going to revenge, avenge our blood? When are you going to judge the earth? And there was given each of them a white robe. This proves that they were believers. Only believers receive white robes in the book of um, Revelation. And they were told that they should dress for a little while. God is saying, wait a little bit more. It's not time yet. Until the lumber of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed. Meaning during this horrible, awful terrible time a lot of people are going to be coming to faith. And those who have been saved are going to be killed. So if somebody is left behind if there is anybody here who hasn't Come to faith for real. And if you're here when the tribulation begins, I want you to know you could still be saved, but you will be killed because of your faith. And as all this is happening, a sixth seal is opened. I look. He, Jesus, broke the sixth seal and there was great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. A time of calamity, a time of terror. On top of all that, and this is still just the beginning. This is only the, the first three, uh, within the first three years. War, famine, death. To it, God is going to add calamities and catastrophes, like earthquakes. Is going to start. Volcano is going to erupt. The sun is going to be blocked. The moon is going to be blocked. That in and of itself is going to create other problems. And then, if though that's not enough, there's going to be meteors that's going to hit the world. And because of all that, the, the physical earth is going to change. Look what it says. And the sky was split apart like a scroll. And when it was rolled up, 
and every mountain and island were moved out from their places. There is going to be seismic shifts on earth. It's going to be so bad. I pray that none of our loved ones or friends are here for that. It's going to be an awful time. But yet, look at this. Verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. At this point, it doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're a king, if you're a slave. It does not matter. Because you lost everything right now. By this time. You're just hiding to save your life in the caves. 16 says, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Yet they're still not repenting. They're hiding. They know who this is coming from. Yet they're still so prideful that they're not repenting. They're not giving in. They don't want to give up. They don't want to surrender. See, why is this going to happen so bad? It's going to happen so that people's trust in themselves will be shaken so that they will see that there is one God and there is one way to God. That's through Jesus Christ. But yet there's going to be so many. Mostly the rich and the powerful and the political reason uh, leaders and all those people. And normal everyday folks too. But first, they, uh, the, the Bible uh, lists them. So most of these people are not going to repent. They're still going to continue in their prideful way. That's why I took so much time today reminding you to get rid of pride that might be in us. And there is in all of us. Just get rid of it, please. Seventeen says, The great day of wrath has come. And who is able to stand it? Yet this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of wrath and tribulation. Next week, we're going to look at the seventh seal. And we're going to look at the 144,000. And then we're going to start looking at the trumpet judgment. Now, you can already see how awful it's going to be. But it's not all bad news. If you come to faith, if you trust in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Now you might say, well, just like I used to. I grew up in a Christian family. I'm Armenian. I was Armenian. I'm still am Armenian. <laughs> I know Jesus. I go to church. Do you know that it means nothing unless you come to repentance and unless you come to surrender your life to him until I come to a, a point in my life where I realize it doesn't matter if you're Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, whatever the name is, pick one, atheist, until I come to that point. Where I say, I know there is a God and I will see him. But if I want to be next to him forever, rather than away from him forever, I need to get rid of my sin. And the only way I could do that is come to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the only one that could take away my sin. 
And until I believe him, not in name only, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Bible says Satan believes, but it doesn't matter. They're going to hell. Knowing that Jesus exists doesn't save me. But surrendering to him saves me. What does it mean to surrender to Jesus? Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. From this moment on, I want to follow you. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to say, I will follow you. Incidentally, Christian means follower of Jesus. So unless you're a Christian, unless you're a follower of Jesus, unless you've surrendered to him, these days of calamity are coming. And Christians are not going to be here to warn you and to teach you. If you don't choose to surrender your life, and you find yourself here during the time of tribulation, please remember, you can still come to faith. It will cost you your life. But you can still come to faith and be forgiven. However, you don't have to wait that long. You can make that decision today. It's a choice. We have to make. Either we will be with him, called paradise, or we will be away from him. Away from everything good, everything peaceful, everything loving, everything joyful, without tear. Away from all that. And that's called hell. Choice is ours. Now, if you're hearing these things for the first time, or is this is penetrating you for the first time in your mind, I want you to know a struggle has begun in your mind and in your heart right now. One is telling you to follow what I'm saying. The other one is telling you to forget it choice is yours. And the decisions you make will be eternal. If you have any questions, please come see me after the service. And um, Lord willing, we will continue next week to see what's awaiting the world in the next coming years. God bless you.